Assalamu alaikum, this is Dr. Mona al author of the Muslim Narcissist book and empowerment coach for Muslims. In today's podcast, I will be answering a question, which is why do narcissists love to ruin Eid and special occasions for their families? So I thought that this would be an important one to record. There's just a few days left of Ramadan and I wanted to give people a heads up on what to expect if they don't know already. So as always, do like, share and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And if you need one-to-one counselling and coaching, you can find my email below. Just send me a brief about your case and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Okay, so let's get into the subject. I'm going to split this podcast into two parts. So I'm going to explain the general reasons why narcissists do this. And I'm also going to explain the religious and spiritual reasons why narcissists love to ruin Eid and special occasions. So the first part will be about the disorder in general. And most people will be able to relate to this, whether you're Muslim or not, because it's about the outward behaviour of these individuals. So I just wanted to make it clear that not all narcissists will ruin Eid and special occasions for you. So if you're not Muslim, this could be Christmas, it could be Easter, it could be any other festival that you consider to be important to you in your faith. Not all narcissists will ruin them because there will always be exceptions to the rule. And the exceptions to the rule in this case would be the narcissists who want to look like mother of the year, father of the year. They want to look like great people in public. Okay, so they want to show everyone that they are doing their best to give their families the best Eid or the best anniversary celebration or the best Christmas or the best holiday, whatever it is. They want to look in public like the best kind of people. So they could be the worst people behind closed doors, right? They could be the worst parents, the worst husbands, the worst wives, the worst siblings. But when it comes to occasions... They make a big deal out of them because the public sees, right? Your extended family sees, your in-laws see, your neighbours see, your friends see. And they want everyone to think highly of them because they really care about their reputation. And they care so much because they know deep down they aren't good people. So in their minds, they believe that if the public, if people outside the family can see them as good people, then they aren't really that bad inside. Okay, so it's done out of insecurity. They care so much about what people think and how people view them because they know deep down there's something wrong with them. So at least in the eyes of strangers and people who aren't living with them, they can be good people, right? They can have that false self because at home, that false self is completely destroyed. At home... The family members, they see the real person. They see the real narcissist behind the false self. And so they have to salvage a part of the false self. And that can only be done with strangers and in public. Now, many of them might even take to social media to show off and brag about everything that they've done to celebrate special occasions. So, for example, they might show videos of a surprise party they threw for their husband or wife or their parents or the extravagant gifts that they bought or the fun fairs that they took their children to and so on and so forth and it will make their family members cringe because they're looking at them thinking that's not you that's not what you normally do you are a nightmare at home the family members know that these people are putting on a show But they stay quiet about it because in their minds it's better than, you know, going through hell during special occasions. So they do know that it's all fake. They know that none of it's real because it's a once in a blue moon thing that these narcissists take advantage of. Okay, like I said, they wait for these special occasions so that they can show everyone that they are wonderful people, wonderful family members, wonderful husbands and wives and parents and and all of that. So that's one reason why narcissists like to do it, because they want to be seen as good people. The second reason why narcissists do this is because they're preparing for their victim story. Okay, so narcissists know that there will be an expiration date 
for every relationship they get themselves into. They know eventually the people whom they're with, and this could be anyone, like I said, parent, spouse, child, they're going to get really sick of the narcissist eventually. And they're going to be sick of all the abuse. And one day they're going to talk, right? One day they're going to start talking about everything the narcissist has put them through. And so when the narcissist goes out of their way to show that they're a good person and that they're dad of the year or mother of the year or husband of the year and so on, it helps them to gain the support of people who do not live with them. Okay, so people will say, no, it's not possible for, you know, this person to be telling the truth about, you know, this uh, individual because, you know, we've seen what they've done for their family. We've seen how wonderful they are, you know, during Eid. They've celebrated all the occasions so nicely. They've, you know, spent so much money on their family. They've taken their family on amazing holidays. They spent so much on their education. You know, they did this and they did that. No, we can't believe that such a person, such an individual, could inflict that much abuse on someone, especially their family members. So that's why they gain a lot of flying monkeys during their smear campaign, because people tend to side with the narcissist. And they know this very well. This is what they prepare for. So narcissists who go out of their way to show in public that they are good people, more often than not, they're preparing for their victim story. They know they're going to need this later. This is information and evidence that they need to collect so that they can use it later in their smear campaign. And they can go around telling everyone that you are the ungrateful one. Look what I did. You know, look what I took her, look what I did for him, look what I bought them, look what I invested in. And they were so ungrateful, they're going around telling everyone that I'm the abuser. What kind of, can you see what kind of people I've been living with? Can you see what kind of woman I've been married to? She's so ungrateful, you know, complaining about abuse, but I did X, Y, Z and you all saw it. You all saw it on social media, you all saw it in real life. So be wary of this. Okay, when they are super nice during occasions, more often than not, it's because of this, especially when they are horrid at home. And when they play father of the year or mother of the year, they use this also as evidence in child custody cases. So they will collect all of these, you know, events and present them to the judge and say, look, you know, everyone can vouch for me. Everyone can be a witness to me as to what I've done for my children and how much I've gone out of my way to make my children happy. And it will only be on those occasions because people don't see what happens at home behind closed doors. Okay, so these are the narcissists who will not ruin special occasions for you, whether they are religious or not, because this will be their agenda. Now, the ones who do ruin Aid and special occasions will do it for various reasons. So I'm going to list the reasons that they do this from a non-religious perspective and then I'll go on to the religious explanation inshallah. So in no particular order, the first reason will be to show you deliberately that you are not significant enough or important enough to celebrate you or the occasion. So remember I said to you before in previous podcasts that covert narcissists like to be the most important person in the relationship, right? They like to be put on a pedestal. They like to be worshipped. And so when they are put in a position where they have to make you happy and they have to see your happiness and your joy, it puts them in a very uncomfortable situation because now they have to come down from that pedestal and give to others the way people are giving to them. So Eid is not just about them, okay? Anniversaries are not just about them. And other festivals aren't always just about them. It's about the whole family. And they don't like that. When it's not just about them, they now feel like you're taking away their pedestal. You're taking away their spotlight. And they have to find a way of making this family event all about them. And so they go out of their way to show you that you're not important. 
and that your wants and needs are not important because the world revolves around them. So, you know, there are many examples of this on social media now where people are starting to film and notice the things that narcissists do to ruin events. So, for example, you would have a narcissist at a baby shower and, you know, there's a countdown to when they pop a balloon or whatever it is that they do to reveal the gender of the baby. And before the countdown is finished, he'll pop the balloon, right? Just to ruin the experience for the mother. Because there's a build-up now of excitement for when the countdown finishes for the gender to be revealed. But he cuts that short by popping the balloon early and making it his decision to do that. Okay, so everyone's agreed that the balloon is popped at this particular time when the countdown is finished, but he's like, nope, I'm going to do it my way. And sometimes you see the woman running off. She's so upset, you know, she's in tears. Sometimes it's the mother-in-law who does this. You know, the narcissistic mother-in-law, the narcissistic mother, they're the ones who pop the balloon early just to ruin the experience for this woman who may be having her first child. And sometimes it might even be the narcissistic sister who's jealous of this sister who's having a baby. Or it could be a narcissistic jealous friend. Okay, they will do something or they'll forget to bring something important. But they haven't actually forgotten. They've deliberately left it behind. So maybe, you know, the bride or this new mother has said to them, look, I really need you to bring this with you. It's really important that you have this at the event. So I'm giving you this, you know, this important task of bringing it with you and making sure that, you know, everything goes well and they deliberately don't do it. And they pretend to forget to bring that important thing that they have been reminded constantly about just to ruin the mood of this lady who is meant to be celebrating something that's really important to her. Okay, Um, another example is the wedding cake disaster that usually happens at weddings with narcissistic men when you know it comes to feeding each other the cake and he just slams the cake in her face or he gives her a very big bite of cake knowing that she won't be able to chew it properly so it looks bad on video and then she gets very frustrated because she feels humiliated and you can see it right you can see it in the video that he's ruined that moment for her and then you get some grooms as well who will, you know, check out the women at the wedding and she will notice and he will also, you know, ruin her mood at the wedding because, you know, he's meant to be her groom. I've seen this a lot, where the groom will check out the women shamelessly and he's blatantly disrespecting the bride in front of everyone and she's so embarrassed, you can see it. And you feel so sorry for her. She's in a mood now, she's really upset, sometimes again... You know, they run out of the wedding in tears because they're so humiliated. But they do this. They do this so that the attention is steered back to them. Okay, I've even seen a groom start smoking on the stage at his wedding because he felt like doing it. And it's, you know, it's a a sign of disrespect to be doing something like this. But he's like, I don't care. The world revolves around me. I'm going to sit here and smoke on the stage and I don't care what people say. I don't care if it's going to embarrass this woman who I'm marrying and her family. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And that's how they ruin the moment. They ruin such a a beautiful day by doing something like that. And another example could be, you know, at a birthday party. Now, this isn't about whether birthdays are halal or haram. I'm talking about people who celebrate birthdays and, you know, they enjoy having family around and friends to you know, celebrate this occasion, sometimes narcissists will have people round for a dinner, okay, for example, to celebrate the birthday of the wife or the daughter-in-law or the sister or the mother and they will feel very uncomfortable with so much attention being poured onto the birthday woman. So someone might say to her, oh, you look amazing at 40, right? You don't look 40 at all. I can't believe you're 40 today. And then the husband will jump in and be like, oh, don't don't think that this is natural. Oh, she does Botox all the time. 
and she can't take a photo without a filter. She's got fillers in her lips, fillers in her cheeks, fillers in her neck, fillers everywhere. Oh, she wouldn't look like this naturally at 40. It's because she spends so much money on surgeries that she looks like this. So much money on beauty treatments that makes her look half decent. They have to jump in with remarks like this because they don't like the attention being on you. And again, it steers back to them, right? They steer the attention back to them. Like now it's about how lucky this woman is to be with me because she wouldn't look like this at 40 if it wasn't for me spending all my money on her beauty treatments to look this good. It's because of my money that I'm spending on her to look this good that you're getting these compliments. If it wasn't for my money, you wouldn't be getting these compliments. You'd look like a tramp. So now she has to be grateful for this money that he's spending on her to look great at 40, right? Now, women do this as well to men. Women will do this and they'll say things like, well, you know, it took him a long time for him to look half decent like this. I've been on his case about going to the gym. I made him go on a diet. He had a disgusting belly before. He was hideous before. I made him get a hair transplant. I made him do this and I made him do that for him to look this good. They say things like this. They have to sugarcoat personal attacks. They do it so that it's a joke. They want it to come across as a joke, but they actually mean it. And people will feel a bit uncomfortable with the narcissist saying these things, but they will laugh it off to make it look like, oh, it's, I'm just joking, you know. And they'll see their wife or their husband get really upset, you know, and their face will turn like, you don't, why did you say that? You didn't need to say that. And the narcissist is like, oh, just chill. You know, why are you so serious about everything? Why do you have to cry over everything? Just relax and stop being so insecure. You know, sometimes this is something the mother-in-law says. The mother-in-law will be the one to point out that her daughter-in-law has had Botox done or fillers done, you know. Or she'll say, oh, no, she never used to look like this. You know, we pestered her and nagged her to go and get that liposuction done because she was so overweight. And alhamdulillah, she listened to me. Because she listened to me, she looks good now. You know, this is the result of the surgery because she was so fat before. Yeah, mother-in-laws are like this. Sometimes mothers are like this as well. I'm going to do another podcast, inshallah, about malignant mothers. But this is how they ruin your day, right? You feel really good about yourself. You know, you feel happy. Everyone's there celebrating with you. It's your 40th, it's your 50th, whatever. And you're feeling good. You're looking good. And then they have to come and inject those remarks to ruin your day. And sometimes if you're co-parenting with a narcissist, they won't let you have the children on special occasions. So Mother's Day, for example, Father's Day, your birthday, one of the Eid days, they don't allow the children to come and celebrate with you because they're jealous, right? They want to ruin your day by not allowing you to have the kids on that day. So that's another very common thing that they do. And they will make up an excuse saying, oh, I'm sick or the children are sick or something's happened, or something so petty, like, oh, because you didn't listen to me the other day, you're not having the kids today. Because you didn't do X, Y, Z, I'm not going to allow the kids, you know, to come to yours today. And there's nothing you can do about it. And they'll switch off their phone. You know, you can't get hold of them. And they know how important it is for the kids to be with you that day. Especially if it's, like I said, Mother's Day, Father's Day, and you just want the kids to spend that day with you. They will sabotage that day because they don't want you to have what you want. Another thing they do to show you that you are not important and insignificant is they don't bring you gifts. Okay, so it might be your anniversary. There are no flowers, no chocolates, nothing. It might be your birthday. It might be Eid. They bring nothing. It's like they don't care at all. And they don't. I hate to break it to you, but they really don't care. And you may have told them before what you'd like for Eid, what you'd like for your birthday, what you'd like, you know, at, at this occasion. And you make it clear, but they still don't bring it because they don't want to bring it. In their minds, they're thinking, I'm the one who's on the pedestal. I'm the one who should be served here. You should be bringing me gifts. 
It shouldn't be me doing what you want. No, you serve me. You worship me. Don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me how to love you and how to treat you. That's not how this relationship works. Everything is on my terms, not your terms. You can't be telling me what you want and what you need. You're here for me. Not I'm not here for you. You're here for me. And everything that I've already done for you before is enough. Why are you asking for more? I've already bought you things before. Why do I have to bring you things every year? Why do I have to bring you things every Eid and every birthday? There's no need. And they'll make up an excuse for that. You know, they are the stingiest people ever, covert narcissists. You'll find that overt narcissists are actually quite generous. But the covert narcissists, oh, they are the worst when it comes to being stingy. They hate spending money on people if they're not love bombing them. So if they've captured you as a victim, they no longer want to spend money on you. Okay, because now the love bombing is over. I've captured you. I've spent my money on you to capture you. And now that's it. Don't ask me to spend another penny on you. And if they do, it really feels forced. It really feels like they are struggling to, you know, reach into their pocket to spend on you because they don't see that they have to anymore. And they might even have money, right? They might be wealthy. They may have a very good income, but they don't see you worth it, okay? You're now a victim in their eyes. Why do I have to spend on my victim? I'm not going to spend on my victim, So they will get out of spending on you as much as possible. And if they do have to spend on you, like it being our Islamic right as a woman, they will give you the basic minimum that they can get away with. They're not generous. And again, if they're generous, it's for show. It's so that they can, you know, build up their victim story later. But nine times out of ten, you will find that covert narcissists will always give you the basic minimum. And they want you to accept that and never complain about it. Okay? Now, if they do get you gifts, it's never what you want. That's the other thing. They might get you something, but it's not what you want at all. They get you what they want to get you. So you may have told them, I would love to have an iPhone for my birthday or for Eid. But they go and get you a Samsung. Or they go and buy you something that you don't need at all. Or something that is of no interest to you, okay? So it could be a video game that they want to play. It could be a book they want to read. It could be, you know, tickets to the cinema to watch a movie they want to watch. Or a theatre show they want to see. Or a day out they want to go on. It will always be in their benefit when they buy you something. And they might even buy you clothes, Because they want to see those clothes on you. Those clothes make them happy. Even though they might not look good on you. Or they're not to your taste at all. Maybe you don't like that colour. But they don't care. They want to see you in it. Okay? Now there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with, you know, your husband or wife buying you clothes that they like to see you in. But when they buy you something that is the opposite of what you asked for. This is the problem. They can buy you those clothes at any other time of the year. But when it comes to the special occasion where you've asked for an iPhone specifically, for example, and they go and buy you you know, a piece of clothing that you would never want to wear, it's upsetting. Okay, it's really upsetting, but they do this deliberately. They will go out of their way to not get you what you want. And then they act surprised when... You're not that happy, you know, when you open the gift. They might not even make any efforts to wrap the gift or do anything nice. You know, even if they buy you flowers, there might be shabby flowers from the petrol station and not the big, beautiful bouquets that you see on Instagram, right? So they'll be like, well, what are you sulking for? I got you flowers. You asked for flowers. I got you flowers. But they're so cheap and tatty that you don't even know how to explain to this idiot of a person why you're upset because they are enjoying playing dumb they know 
that these are cheap flowers. They know it's not what you wanted. They know that the box of fur rocher is not what you wanted. But they want to get away with the basic minimum and still say, I got you what you wanted. You see, they'll get you the cheapest of what you wanted and pass it off as them doing you know, their duty as a husband or wife or friend or, or whatever. Okay. So even if you ask them for a gold bracelet, for example, they'll get you the cheapest gold bracelet. Like it won't even be real gold. It might be just, you know, gold plated or something. It won't be what you want. You might ask for a ring. You might ask for, I don't know, anything. And they'll just never give you what you want. So this is something to bear in mind. They know exactly what they're doing. Now, unless you know your husband or your wife or your friend cannot afford to buy you what you want, then that's different, obviously, right? You can make an excuse for that person. And, you know, it's always best to not ask for things that you know someone can't afford so that you don't get disappointed. But when you know they can afford it, but they've decided not to do it, it's hurtful when you take it personally. Okay, because now you feel unworthy. Now you feel unloved because you haven't disconnected yourself from their disorder. And their disorder includes them being 50 shades of immature and 50 shades of stupid. And they will be cruel like this. So the sooner you know this and let this sink in, the better. Because people are being traumatized as a result of taking this behavior personally. Okay? Now, another thing they do to not make you feel important is that they pretend to forget the special occasion. So, for example, they'll, you know, pretend to forget your birthday and they might tell you happy birthday at the end of the day, right? At the end of the day before you go to bed and then they see that you're sulking. They know it's your birthday. They know. And you've been sulking all day because they've forgotten. No gifts, no party, no nothing no celebration, and you're waiting for them to see that you're upset and ask you about it. And then they're like, oh, I've just realised I've forgotten your birthday today. Happy birthday. (laughs) Happy birthday. I hope you had a good day. (laughs) And they'll roll over and just go to sleep. They don't care. They don't care. They will do it deliberately to leave it till last minute and enjoy seeing you really upset about it. And then they shame you for making a big deal out of your birthday. So, for example, if you continue sulking, you know, you're still upset about it. They'll start to shame you by saying things like, are you five to be crying over your birthday? You know, what kind of woman are you? What kind of man are you to be crying over your birthday? You need to grow up. You need to stop acting like a child. You know, we have a birthday every year. So what? You know, I don't celebrate my birthday. My parents don't celebrate theirs. My siblings don't celebrate theirs. You know, what's wrong with you? Why is it that you're so immature? Khalas, enough of this sulky face. Enough of this moody face. I'm sick of your moody face. Grow up and be an adult. They'll do that to get out of accountability. And so that they do not feel guilty for doing that to you. They will turn the table on you to make it look like you're the silly one. You know, for getting upset over your birthday and then forgetting your birthday. And you wanting happy birthday sung to you and all of that. They just make you feel like a silly child. And then eventually you get over it. Right? They don't make it up to you because... They've already given you the impression that, hey, don't expect me to be making this up to you because you're acting like a fool. You know, this is embarrassing behavior. You're crying over your birthday and you're 50 years old. Get over it. You know, get over it so we can get on with our lives. Lots of them are like this. And then you get, you know, some days when you have something really important. Like, you know, it could be your baby shower. It could be your graduation, and they don't take the day off for it. They might leave their work for an hour or two to come and attend. And even when they attend, they attend with a moody face. 
They're moody in all the pictures that you take with them. They don't smile. They look like someone slapped them around the face with a wet fish and that they're forced to be there. Okay, when you ask them, like, you know, why are you so moody? Can you not just smile in the picture? This is my graduation. You know, this is the baby shower. Can you just at least smile in the pictures? They'll go off in a huff. Like, what do you want me to do? I've left work for you. I've done this for you. I've done that for you. You're so ungrateful. They storm off. Now you've got no pictures and you've got a fight on your hands. Okay, now you've got to deal with this narcissist when they come back in the evening after work and deal with all their headache again. So they don't like you having any kind of joy or happiness. They have to ruin it right? They have to ruin it. They will not show you that you're important by taking the day off and doing something special for you, showing you that, you know, this day means a lot to me as well, because I can see how much it means to you. Oh, they don't understand that language. They don't understand that language at all. I mean, they might even fake an illness on that day. It might be, again, your birthday, Eid. It could be, you know, your parents anniversary party or something and they'll fake a headache they'll fake food poisoning they'll fake being sick so that they don't go and then they make you feel guilty when you do go ahead with the celebration without them you know they don't like that they want you to stay and cater to them and not have your fun or they'll just create an issue that day they'll start a fight over something that day it could be over breakfast, it could be over coffee, it could be over anything. They will go off in a tantrum about something on the morning of Eid. On the morning of, you know, your bridal shower or your baby shower, whatever it is. Christmas morning, whatever. And they will decide to create an issue that morning. The kids might irritate them and they might blow the whole issue out of proportion. You know, you kids, oh, you're always doing this to me. I'm not spending a head with you today. You can go and do it on your own. I'm going to go out with my friends. I'm going to go and do X, Y, Z because I can't be bothered to spend my day with people like you. And then a fight will happen and then it will get even worse that you answered back to the narcissist or you argued with the narcissist and they might start doing erratic things like tearing down decorations that you put up for Eid. Right, They might even drop the cake that you bought. They might destroy something that you've made, something that you've cooked or baked. They'll go and they'll destroy it. They will just throw it in the bin, throw it in the sink. They might smash things. They can be really erratic like this when they know it causes maximum stress and maximum pain. Okay, They don't want to start the day on a good note. Eid day in particular. There's something about Eid day that they hate. Okay, and they will always cause a problem that morning. They will find something to pick on or to create a problem out of. And they will start destroying things in the house and destroying everyone's mood in the process. And then they'll storm out of the house. Or they will cancel Eid for everyone. Because you answered back to me, there's no Eid today. We're not going anywhere. We're not doing anything. Call your parents and tell them we're not coming. Call my parents and tell them we're not coming because of you. Because you answered back to your husband. Because you did this to your wife. And so on and so forth. They put you in these positions where you have to do humiliating things like call your family to tell them you can't come for Eid and you have to make up a lie. You know, the husband's sick. I'm sorry, but I'm unable to make it for Eid dinner because, you know, Ahmed's unwell. But Ahmed has caused a huge tantrum in the house because he wants to ruin Eid for everyone. Or Sarah has decided to have a rage tantrum because... Her husband didn't get her the gold she wanted for Eid because he couldn't afford it. She's like, well, I'm sorry. You know, I told you that's what I wanted. You didn't get it for me. There's no Eid. You're not going anywhere. I'm going out with my family. We're not going to your family. 
and then we have problems over who goes to who in Eid. I'm not going to your family. You're not going to your family. I'm not going to visit this person. And you're not going to see your friends. And you better cancel this. And you better cancel that. Because we're not doing it. And if you go, you'll see what I'll do to you later. And if you disrespect me and disobey me, you might be divorced by the end of the day. You better be careful. You better watch what you're doing. And if you go to that aid party wearing that dress or wearing that makeup or, you know, going to your sister's house knowing, you know, your brother-in-law is there, I will not forgive you. I will do this and I will do that. They start threatening and they just ruin your entire day. Your entire day is ruined and they do it deliberately. They wait until Eid morning. They wait until that day when they can just ruin it for everyone. Because it's their way of showing you you're not important, you're not significant. And they might go around popping all the balloons. And they'll do it in such a satanic way and in a way that causes you maximum stress because the sound of balloons popping is stressful. And so they do it quickly and erratically so that all you're hearing constantly is the popping of balloons. Again, just to emphasise that Eid is over. We're not having anyone round. And we're not going anywhere. And this, you know, this party that you've been looking forward to for such a long time. Yeah, we're cancelling that. We're not going there. Because you answered back or because you didn't do this or didn't do that. So a lot of people go through this behind closed doors. And then eventually they will turn up to the Eid gathering or the Eid dinner with a smile on their face. After the hell they went through that morning or that afternoon. And just to show face, they might have had to beg their husbands and wives, you know, to go to their families so that people don't start talking. You know, why did they not turn up to the Eid dinner? You know, it's a family gathering. Why did they not come? And sometimes you've got to beg your husband or beg your wife to save face and go so that people don't start talking. And you go with this fake smile on your face. Right? You go and attend like everything is fine and people are complimenting the wife whom gave you absolute hell that morning. Oh, your wife looks lovely. Oh, the food your wife brought is absolutely delicious. Oh, what a wonderful wife you have. And you're seething inside because all you're thinking about is the morning of hell she gave you and the kids. Or someone will compliment your husband or your mother-in-law or your mother about something and And you're just thinking, if only you knew what we had to go through to even attend this aid gathering this evening. If only you knew what we had to go through. If only you knew what it took to get everyone out of the house. In one piece, you wouldn't believe, right? The kids are all traumatised. The kids hate aid because every year it's the same thing. There's always a problem. There's always a drama. Mum always kicks up a fuss. Dad always has a problem. And they don't look forward to it. You know, sometimes the father will even punish the kids on aid day. They might do something like fight in the morning, you know, amongst themselves. And dad's like, there's no aid money. Sorry, no aid gifts. You know, you've been naughty. You're not getting anything today. And it will just traumatise the kids. There are so many people who do this. There are so many people who hit their kids on Eid day for, you know, just doing silly childish things. And that puts a damper on the day as well. Or sometimes the father will sleep in and not take his family to Eid prayer. Or he won't take his children to Eid prayer because he can't be bothered. Don't bother me, I want to sleep. I don't want to go to the Eid prayer. And you're not taking them either. You, their mother, you're not taking them. And no, you're not going with your brother. And you're not going with your nephew. And you're not going with your father. You can't go with anyone. No mahram. Only me and I can't be bothered to go. I want to sleep so everyone misses out on Eid prayer. And sometimes they might even go to a Eid gathering with the family or friends. And they won't dress nicely. They won't dress in nice Eid clothes. Or they will be the ones to dress in the best clothing. And their family doesn't because they didn't buy their family nice new clothes for Eid. Okay, do you know how many women tell me 
that their husbands did not buy them anything new for Eid. No jewellery, no dresses, no dresses for the kids, nothing. No thobs for the boys, nothing. But he bought himself a very nice thob, a very nice new perfume, very nice new watch. There are loads of narcissistic men like this who buy themselves the best of everything and they don't do it for their families. So many women have told me that they've had to wear old clothes for Eid because their husbands, especially the women who don't work, okay, I'm talking about women who don't have their own money to buy their own clothes if their husbands don't provide, they've had to wear old clothes and the children have had to wear old clothes because the husband is so stingy, he doesn't spend on his family. Okay, so I'm just giving you loads of examples and scenarios so that you can relate to and, you know, you can apply them to your own situations. But it's for you to gain a very comprehensive understanding of what it is that you're dealing with or other people could be dealing with or what you could be saving yourself from if you're not yet married. Okay, I hope this puts people off, you know, brushing red flags under the carpet when you meet someone don't risk it. This is what you're going to be putting yourselves through. Don't risk it. Okay, I'm hoping, inshallah, that there are lots of single people listening to these podcasts and it's putting you off, taking that risk of brushing red flags under the carpet when you meet someone. Well, lie, you've got to take these things seriously because this is what you're going to go through. So after they make you feel insignificant and unimportant, the second reason why they love to ruin aids and special occasions for you is because they can never be happy for you as a result of them not feeling any happiness within themselves. So the core of narcissistic personality disorder is shame, anger, guilt, bitterness, resentment, envy, jealousy, all of these emotions, right? Happiness is not there. Narcissists do not know how to be happy. And they feel uncomfortable when they are around happy people. And so they have to pop that balloon of happiness as soon as possible because you are experiencing an emotion they are unable to experience. And they get envious of your happiness and your joy and they want to take it from you as soon as possible. And that's why they can never be happy for you. They don't know how to. Okay, it's a part of their disorder. They don't know how to be happy for you. And they don't know how to be happy. Nothing can make them happy. They will feel joy short term. But it's never lasting. So when they see that you are happy for more than 24 hours about something. Oh, they have to destroy it. They have to create a problem, an argument, a petty issue. They have to do something to destroy that. Because they don't understand how you can be happy for long periods of time. They are seriously depressed individuals. They hate themselves. People who hate themselves really struggle to find joy and happiness in anything. Okay? When you hate yourself to that degree where you self-sabotage your own life and the lives of others. Tell me what you're going to find happiness in. They find happiness in overpowering people, controlling people, feeling important, right? Having their ego boosted, they love that. But it's not happiness, it's just power. Okay, they don't gain happiness from this. They gain satisfaction of having a hold over people and having a power over people. It just gives them an ego boost that they need to carry on through life. It doesn't give them happiness. They don't know what gives them happiness. They haven't found what gives them happiness yet. Okay, because their hearts have become so closed and so cold and so dark from the accumulation of sins that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken the mercy from their hearts. So they don't know where happiness is. So until they find that connection with Allah and they start to become people who wish to elevate their nerves, they will never find happiness. So don't ever expect them to be happy for you. Don't ever expect them to share your joy. They will share your joy in public in front of other people because they don't want to look like abusers and they don't want people to clock on to them. 
as being toxic. So they'll fake being happy in public. And that's why most people who are narcissistic, they avoid public celebrations because they can't fake it, right? They can't fake it. And when they can't fake it, you put them in a very uncomfortable position of exposing themselves. And that's why they tend to just go off and sleep. They're like, I'm tired. I'm going to go and take a nap. Or I'm going to go and see my friends. Or I've got an important business meeting to attend to. I've got work that I need to do. They cut it short because they can't fake happiness for you. Okay, they leave an event early or a family gathering early or a party early or a wedding early because they can't fake happiness. They know it's only a matter of time before someone in the crowd watches them and clocks onto their behaviour. Like, what's wrong with her husband? What's wrong with his wife? She looks miserable as hell. And she's being abusive, the way she's talking to him, the way he's talking to her, the body language, what's going on over here? He looks a bit abusive. She looks a bit abusive. They know this is going to happen, so they cut it short and they might leave you at the event and you'll be upset because you want your husband there with you. You want your mother with you, your father with you. But they're like, nope, sorry, I've got something important to do. I've got to leave because they've reached their threshold of faking it. They can't fake it anymore. They have to leave before they get exposed. And it's also making them feel sick being around people who are so happy. And that's why they hate weddings, right? They hate these occasions where people are so joyous and celebrating and all of that because they're like, I've never felt that happiness before. I can't relate to this. It's making me reflect on my own depression and my own toxicity. I want to get out of here. I don't want to sit here for another five minutes because I'm starting to feel really awkward about myself. I'm starting to feel like there's something seriously wrong with me. You know, why can't I be happy for these people? Why do I envy these people? Why do I hate these people for being happy? Get me out of here. Quick excuse and they're out. That's if they don't make you go with them. Sometimes narcissists will make you go with them too. And you don't want to leave. You want to stay at the wedding. You want to stay at the Eid party. They're like, nope, you're coming with me. That's it. We've had enough. But we haven't had dinner yet. I don't care. You're coming with me. We're not staying here another five minutes. Why? I don't like the people here. There's a weird vibe about this place. You know, your family are giving me weird looks. Your family don't like me. Your friends, they're not treating me with respect you know, this is not a halal environment. They'll give you so many excuses to leave. And they'll just be making something up. They'll be paranoid about something. And you'll be so frustrated saying, well, my family love you. I don't see what the problem is. I'm telling you, your brother doesn't like me. I'm telling you, your mother, she's been giving me daggers all night. I don't want to stay here. Get me out of here. And he will force you to leave. Or she will force you to leave using these excuses. And that's how they ruin that occasion for you, right? They ruin it for you. And then you get embarrassed because everyone's looking at you and saying, you've only been here for 30 minutes. What's the rush? You know, where are you going? We haven't, you know, done the cake yet. We haven't done the gifts yet for the kids. You know, the kids still, you know, need to receive their aid money. I'm so sorry. I've got to go. Ahmed's got a headache. Ahmed's not feeling well. We've got to, we've got to get somewhere, you know? Or they insist that you now go to their family because they just don't want to be around your family. They insist that you leave early. We're going to my family and you're coming with me. You tell them you go. You know, you go by yourself to your family. Nope. What's my family going to say? My family are going to say that I'm a, I'm a man who's controlled by my wife. Or, you know, I am a woman who has a rubbish husband doesn't come with me to see my family you know what are they going to say you're coming with me it's a complete nightmare a complete and utter nightmare living with these people okay so always be aware that these people because they don't feel joy within themselves they can never feel joy for you don't have that expectation of them so moving on to the third point now of things they do to ruin your special day is that they break bad news on your special day, 
okay? So, for example, it could be your anniversary, your wedding anniversary. It could be your first wedding anniversary. And they tell you on that day, they want a second wife. Or they tell you they have taken a second wife. They want to ruin your anniversary day, your special day, by telling you this. By breaking this news to you on that day. They might even tell you on top of that, that I have already taken a second wife and she's pregnant. Or she's given birth today. I need to go to the hospital because the secret wife I never told you about is in hospital giving birth to my baby. Oh, trust me, I've heard that one, okay? There are some sneaky, slimy, disgusting people out there who will break this kind of news to people on their happy days. And this could be a Eid day, could be a birthday, could be a graduation day. They will drop a bombshell on you, right? A bombshell that knocks you for six and could leave you feeling very unwell for many days because of the shock, okay, you were geared up to have an amazing day, you know, to experience happiness and joy and, you know, a fun day out with the kids and all of that, and then they drop something like that on you, and sometimes a woman might even tell you, on Eid day, I've got a confession to make, I'm so sorry, but I can't keep it to myself anymore, I've betrayed you, I've cheated on you. She'll tell you that on a special day. It could even be a day where you're having an exam. Okay? Like, it doesn't even have to be a celebration. It could be, you know, a day when they know you're taking an important exam for something. Or you're going to a very important job interview. They will drop a bombshell on you that morning. And it could be divorce as well. They might ask for a divorce on that day, on Eid day. Or they might even divorce you. They might issue the talaq on Eid day. Anti talaq. Out of the blue. You know, they've just decided to do it on that day. For maximum pain, maximum stress. They will leave things like that to that day. They might even lie about an illness. Or they might know about an illness they've had for a while. But they wait until a special occasion to drop the news on you. The doctor told me I've got cancer. Why are you telling me this now when you've known about it for the last six months? Why are you telling me this now? They tell you on Eid day or a special occasion. Because they want to ruin that day for you. Okay, so bombshell news is a tactic they use to completely destroy your day. You and the kids and whoever whoever else is involved. Now, the next thing they do is create problems during special occasions because you have triggered their childhood wounds. Now, what I mean by this is that you'll be doing things that remind them of what they never had as children. And you make them relive that again. So I'll give you an example. You want to throw a birthday party for your child. You know, he really wants a party with all his friends. He sees all his friends at school, you know, having birthday parties and, you know, he's dying for one. And you've promised him that you'll do one for him. And your husband is seeing this and he's insisting on not doing a birthday party. Insisting on it. And you're like, why? Why? You know, he's your firstborn. Just let him have his birthday party. What's the big deal? And he'll say, no, I don't want to spend money and do this birthday party. There's no need. It's absolutely unnecessary. And he'll go on and on and on and give you so many justifications. Oh, this is haram and this is bid'ah and this is this and this is that. But the real reason is because you remind him of his parents never throwing him a birthday party as a child when he begged them for one. So the difference between empathic people and narcissistic people is that when they were deprived of things in their childhood, they want to compensate themselves and their future children by giving them what they never had. Okay, so 
you know, the birthdays, the gifts, the Eids, the days out, the fun fairs, all of that, if they never had it as children, they want to give it to their children. That's what empathic people do. Narcissistic children, however, they grow up with this bitterness in their hearts towards their parents and they believe that if other children have it, then it means that they're not worthy, they're not deserving of it and they don't like to see other children be more deserving of it than they are, so they'd rather no one has it, okay? No one has what they were deprived of, including their own children. So because I never had birthday parties, you're not going to have birthday parties because my dad never let us go to fun fairs, there's no need for you to go to fun fairs. And because I was never given gifts at Eid, why should I give you gifts at Eid? They have this very immature mentality where they have to deprive everyone because if they give what they didn't have, then it means that they truly were unworthy. Okay? But when they create a norm out of it where, well, this is what my father did, this is what my mother did, so this is what I'm going to continue they allow themselves to believe that it's normal for children not to have those things. So it doesn't make them feel as bad and it doesn't trigger a childhood wound. And when you trigger a childhood wound in a narcissist, you create a crisis, a dilemma, because you make them go there again. And you almost force them to go back. You do this subconsciously, you know, you're not doing this on purpose because you're not aware of it. But to them, they see you forcing them to go back into a memory that they do not want to bring back and it makes them go into a rage. They get really upset and that's why they create a drama and they go crazy over petty things and they ruin that birthday party. They'll do something to ruin it or they don't want to be present. Right? Again, they might stay for like 20 minutes and then rush off. They don't like to be present in these moments because these moments are too painful and then they will punish you for doing that to them but you have no idea what you've done to them right you have no idea that you have reopened a childhood wound and they can never tell you that but they will punish you in other ways for it so if you insisted on doing the birthday party for your child trust and believe that narcissist is going to make you pay for that in one way or another you think of all the punishments that they've inflicted upon you. Those punishments would have been as a result of you reopening a childhood wound because they don't want to go back there. And they don't want to remember all those Eids when their fathers didn't want to take them to their Eid prayer or allow them to play with the kids in the street or allow them to have sweets and, you know, again, go to fun fairs and have all of these activities so when they see other children do it, it just reminds them of how unworthy they felt at that age. And it's a stubborn type of behaviour that they have where they insist everyone else is treated the same. And you'll never understand why, that's the reason why. I mean, you'll even get people snatch babies from breastfeeding because they're like, that's enough, you know. Because they were never breastfed. Their mothers never cared about them enough to breastfeed them. They just kept giving them bottled milk because they always wanted to go out and have fun. And now they see their children, you know, having the privilege of being breastfed. They don't like it. And they don't like it when they see, you know, mothers or even fathers pamper and spoil their children. Because you constantly remind them of what they didn't have. And that's why they get jealous of their own children. And that's why they ruin Eid for their own children. Okay, they do it. Again, it's a part of their disorder. And it's something that you need to learn how to detach from. I help people with this in my counselling and coaching sessions. So I can cut you free from that trauma bond. Okay, if you need help with it. But this is essentially what drives a lot of people insane. Because they don't understand why the narcissist behaves in such an unexplainable way, right? They're punishing you for something you don't even know what you've done. 
And especially when they punish the kids, you think they're just innocent kids. Why are you, you know, being so dramatic and so ruthless and brutal with them? For what? They just want to enjoy Eid morning and have their gifts and, you know, play with other kids. Why are you being so disgusting with them and vile in your behavior and attitude? What's wrong with you? Because you'll never get that explanation from them. You will always be left reeling and depressed and feeling anxiety because you have no idea what it is that you've done. So you're always blaming yourself and feeling like you're the problem because this narcissist can never open up to you about their childhood trauma. And I know all of this because I speak to so many narcissists. I've met so many in my life. So many have opened up to me about very painful experiences that they had gone through. So I know that this is what they go through because of my experience with them, counselling them, coaching them and meeting them in my life, right? I've come across a lot of people like this. So when I tell you this is how they feel, it's not just from my head. These are narcissists who have told me and they've always told me similar things. So, you know, you've really got to be careful when you're dealing with these people, because if you're dealing with them without being aware of this disorder, you can get yourself in a lot of trouble. You can get yourself in a lot of unnecessary depression and iman issues and, and, you know, health issues, because, again, you're taking it upon yourself as a burden to carry when it's not your burden to carry. Okay, it's not your problem to carry. It's theirs. But because you don't understand what their problem is, you are suffering unnecessarily as a result of not knowing who this person is whom you're living with, okay? And it's not your job to fix them. A lot of people say to me, I want to fix this narcissist who I'm with. You can't fix them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not even burden the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with this mission of changing people, okay? He didn't tell him to go and fix all these narcissistic people, all the psychopaths in the world. He didn't ask him to do that. He said to him, your only mission is to convey the message. That's it. Whoever wants to listen will listen. Whoever doesn't want to listen won't listen. Your job is only to advise and give knowledge and help people who want to be helped. But there are people who don't want to be helped. Okay, there are people who don't want to be guided and there's no help for them. You are not responsible for those people. He was a prophet and Allah did not give him that task. So imagine, you know, what Allah would say to your average person who is trying to change a narcissist or fix a narcissist. You can't. Allah does not expect you to do that because it's a problem within themselves. It's an internal jihad and nafs that they have to battle and overcome to change as people. You can't change a narcissist and a narcissist will never change for another human being because they always have to have superiority over other people and that power and control. So they'll never change for you. They will change when they feel it is time to change. And usually that's when they hit rock bottom. Okay, they receive a humbling experience that causes them to reevaluate everything in their life. And you know, embark on a healing journey. Some narcissists do this, you know, not every narcissist is a lost cause. There are narcissists who do want to change and they do want to get better. But it does take a certain amount of self-awareness for them to even start that journey. Okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet Muhammad Sallam in Surah Al-Qasas, Ayah 56, you surely cannot guide whoever you like, O Prophet. But it is Allah who guides whoever he wills, and he knows best who are fit to be guided, who are ready to be guided. Okay, so Allah will guide people when they're ready to be guided, when they are open to guidance, when they are open to receiving their healing and help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If people don't want it, if they don't want guidance, if they don't want help, 
they're not going to be helped or guided by Allah. Okay? So, you know, it's easy for people to feel sorry for narcissists. You know, when you listen to my podcast, you think, oh, you know, I feel bad that their childhood wounds are being triggered. All of them go through this. But they know there's something wrong with them, but they don't want to change. They don't want to seek help for it. So it's not your problem to get them to that point. Okay, it's not your mission. It's not your task in life. That's their task in life. Okay, they're responsible for themselves. So either they can learn how to relive their childhood through their own children, or they make the decision of staying bitter and angry for the rest of their lives over the past that they can't change. You may also find out on Eid day or on a day of a special occasion that your husband or wife has not quit smoking or drugs or anything else that they had promised to quit and work on because they suddenly felt stressed because of you. So you might have had an argument and it could be your son, it could be your daughter and they take out a cigarette or they take out, you know, the weed that they had been hiding in their rooms or something and they start smoking and they blame you for it, saying, you stressed me out, I've gone back to smoking. But they never quit in the first place. They promised that they would quit. They pretended that they had quit, but they just waited for the right moment to show you that they didn't. So as you can imagine, on Eid morning before you're getting ready, you know, to go to your parents' house or to a Eid party, this is something that can really distress you in the morning. And this is something that you have to deal with. But they don't care. They don't care that you're so distressed. They actually enjoy seeing you so distressed because they have the attitude of, well, what are you going to do about it? And this could be a gambling addiction as well. It could be anything, right? You can relate it to your own situation. And what they want out of this is that you have a fight over it and that you offend them with something so that they can give you the silent treatment, okay? So the silent treatment during Eid and special occasions Oh, they love it. They love inflicting this on people because imagine, imagine the mood when they're going to your graduation or if it's your birthday or if it's your anniversary, imagine how it's going to feel when they're giving you the silent treatment during those special days and they do it for maximum pain and for you to be on high alert with your anxiety, okay? Because now all you're thinking about is them giving you the silent treatment and not being pleasant to be around and you know you're going to get it later. You know that they will punish you further with something else later. So your mind is constantly occupied now with them. Instead of you enjoying your moment, enjoying your big day, enjoying Eid, enjoying your party, you're now thinking constantly about them and it shows in all your pictures and videos. You don't look happy. You look on edge. You look nervous. Because you just don't know how to deal with the situation that he or she has put you in. Again, it could be your parent. Parents are notorious for this. And so are husbands and wives. You know, women in particular love the silent treatment. They love giving it to people. And it's a huge weapon they use when they want to control other people. And they do it with their children as well. Right? They'll give the silent treatment so that the children or the husband, they just want to break that silent treatment as soon as possible and they'll do anything. Because they know if she continues giving them the silent treatment, the whole day is going to get ruined. The whole day is going to be an absolute nightmare dealing with her dark face, right? That face of thunder. They just don't want to deal with it. So they're willing to do whatever it takes to get her out of that mood. And she is lapping that up. Oh, she enjoys that. And sometimes she won't allow them to do anything for her because she's enjoying giving the silent treatment she wants to extend it for as long as possible but in front of other people she will infuriate you because she will act very sweet very fake sometimes narcissists can't hide it in front of others right everyone knows that they're upset with you because they give you those looks and treat you badly but some people can really fake it in front of family and friends and you just feel sick because you know they're giving you the silent treatment but they want to look like a wonderful person in front of other people but as soon as you get in that car as soon as you step inside it it starts again right the abuse starts again she might start screaming at you he might start shouting verbal abuse at you and going on and on and on 
about how much they can't stand you, how much they wish they were never married to you, how much they wish that they had married someone else and that they never had kids with you. Oh, they'll go on a roll. Okay, they'll go on a roll with all of these insults, all of this verbal abuse. So the verbal abuse will come out on these days. They will come out on other days too, but you will find that they selectively choose these special days to increase the dose of abuse. And that could be physical too, right? That could be physical as well. So whatever it takes to ruin those days, oh, they're going to do it. They're going to do it because they can't stand to see you happy. It makes their skin crawl to see you happy. They don't want to see you happy. And that's why narcissists can live with people who are very miserable and depressed. Because a lot of people ask themselves, you know, why do narcissists stay with people who don't want to be there, who hate them, who can't stand to be around them? That's their prime environment. That's what they want to see. They don't want to be with people who are happy. So the more miserable you are, the more depressed you are, the more enraged you are, the happier they are. Because it means they're winning. It means they have control over your emotions and it means that they are destroying your life. That's their mission. That's their spiritual mission. They're destroying your life. So for them, they don't mind being with someone who hates them and who doesn't want to be in the marriage or who doesn't want to be in that family house. They don't care. Because as long as you are miserable, they're happy. And they will always find something to trigger you and they will always find something to ruin your day. Okay, you might have the best day with your family. Maybe you're, you know, again, you're celebrating your graduation with your family and then your husband hits you up with those text messages. You know, you're taking too long. Why are you out for so long? You didn't call me. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. There's no food at home. Your baby's crying. I need you to come home immediately because it's not my job to be taking care of your baby. You need to be breastfeeding. You need to be this, you need to be that. They do all of this on those days. So that when you're out with your family and you're trying to enjoy your time, you can't. You're now anxious. You're now feeling on edge because you're getting all these text messages from someone who's ruining your day. And this particular person would have stayed at home with the children or with the baby because they don't want to participate in your celebrations, right? They can't stomach it. It's just too much for them. So they let you go with your family, but then when they sit with themselves and think about you having a good time with your family, they don't like it. And now they start to kick up a fuss, and this could be with your friends as well. You could be out with your friends having a good time, celebrating your birthday, celebrating Eid, and they don't like it. They have to create a problem, and it's usually via text messages and abusive, you know, abusive words and, and voice notes and just things that keep you nervous. And keep you worried about returning home because you don't know what you're going to face. So you've now angered the narcissist even more because you're able to have a good time without them. So they don't want you to have a good time with them or without them. So as soon as they realise you're having a good time without them as well, they get jealous, they get envious and they want to take that away from you too. So they start a problem. And sometimes they'll wait until you get home to start the big fight, right? to start the silent treatment to start the spiritual abuse. Allah is not going to be happy with you because you've upset your husband and I will go to bed unhappy. Sometimes the wife will say it, sometimes the parents will say it, that because of you, I'm in a bad mood today, because of you and your selfishness, I am not going to forgive you in front of Allah for you know putting me through this today. Where were you? Why didn't you pick up the phone? Why did you not bring me something back? You know what? I'm not going to give you an allowance this month. You know what? You're not going out with your friends for the next two months. You know what? I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. I'm going to deprive you of this and I'm going to deprive you of that as a punishment because you hurt my ego. You hurt my ego and now I'm going to use Islam to abuse you. Now I'm going to tell you that I won't forgive you. Now I'm going to tell you that I'm going to pray against you. And it's Eid day and it's your birthday And it's your special occasion. I'm going to go right now and pray that Allah does not forgive you and that Allah ruins your day. Oh yeah, they'll do that. They will pray against you and sometimes openly and loudly so that you hear it, so it ruins your day. Okay, just because you've hurt their ego, because they're not so important that day. They're not on a pedestal that day. 
it's a day about you and the kids, it's a day about the family, and not all about them. And so they will use spiritual and religious abuse to get their way and to inflict maximum pain. Okay, another way they use spiritual abuse is when you want to celebrate your birthday and they use something against you from your past to not do it. So for example, you might have told them that as a child I never had a birthday party. My parents never used to do these things for me and I'd really like that now. They'll use that against you. They'll say, oh, you know, why is it that you want me to do the things that your parents never did for you? I'm not doing that. You know, you're already used to not having birthdays. Why now? Why are you putting this burden on me now to get you a cake and get you gifts and do this and do that? This is not from Islam anyway. They'll bring Islam into it. This is a bid'ah. This is haram. Celebrating anniversary is something the Prophet ﷺ never did. And the Prophet ﷺ didn't take his wives on holiday. He didn't take them on a honeymoon. He didn't do this and he didn't do that. To get out of what you want to do. Okay, so what you expect of them, they wriggle out of it by using these excuses and justifications. So, again, you know, they'll say your family never celebrate birthdays. I don't see your family celebrating birthdays. I don't see your families celebrating anniversaries. I don't see your families doing anything special for Eid. So why should we? Why should I do something special for you? You know, why is it that you're putting this on me now? They'll use that. They will study your family to see what they do and don't do. And they will study everything that you've been through in your childhood to know what they can get away with. So you'll find that empathic people will want to give you everything you never had. right? They'll want to do all of those things for you. But the narcissist will use it to his or her advantage to not do it for you. okay? To continue depriving you of things you were deprived of in your childhood. And they get a sick, sadistic joy of doing that to you. Okay, they just want to make you feel unworthy. They want to make you feel like you're, you know, you're not worth that kind of effort. Why should I do that? I'm going to give you every Islamic excuse under the sun. But me, oh me, oh I will commit every major sin. I will continue gambling and smoking drugs and, you know, committing zina behind your back and having affairs and doing this and doing that. Oh yeah, I can justify that for myself Islamically. I will always find a justification for it. But for you, I'll find every Islamic justification to not do it. To show you that it's haram. To show you that it's a bid'ah. And to show you that your family are not doing it, which means you are asking for something out of the norm. You're not asking for something that's normal or considered to be okay. So be wary of this, okay? Spiritual abuse is used heavily during special occasions because they want to get away with not doing anything to make you happy. If they can get away with not doing anything, they will. They will try every trick in the book because not only do they have a disorder, narcissists are extremely lazy. They don't like to do things to make people happy because they don't feel like it's their job. They believe, because of their grandiosity and entitlement, that everyone should be doing what makes them happy, that the world revolves around them. Okay? So, you know, don't ever expect that they will go out of their way for you to make you happy unless there's something in it for them and their reputation. And also don't forget that you can expect the withholding of affection and intimacy during these moments. So you'll find that your wife doesn't want to sleep with you during Eid and during your happy moments and your special days and your husband as well. Okay, they feel sickened at the thought of intimacy while you're in a happy and good mood. They like to ask you for it or pressurize you for it when they know you're not in the mood. But when you're in the mood for it and you want to be intimate with them, They find excuses to not do it, okay, because it can't be on your terms. So you won't get kisses from them, hugs from them. You won't get that warmth from them on Eid morning and, you know, on your birthday. You don't get it from them and if you do, it feels forced. Intimacy feels forced. Hugs feel forced. They feel so robotic and you know something's not right. Something doesn't feel right. So the withholding of intimacy is also another major tactic they use on the days when they know you really want it. And also when you really need it. Okay, they know when you really need it. They know when you really need a hug. 
They know when you need that intimacy and they will get out of it with any excuse they can. Okay, always notice that they do it when you're in a good mood. And this takes me on to the last point of something they do that sabotages your special occasions, which is they downplay your achievements and the importance of that day in improving your life. Okay, so for example, let's say you graduate with a master degree and they only have a bachelor degree. They will feel so jealous of your success and that you have won over them. They will see it that way, that you now have won over them, that you're more educated, that you're more qualified. And so they belittle your achievement for that day. They'll say, oh, you know, I'm going to come to your graduation, but I can only be there for half an hour. And anyway, anyone can get a master's. I'm going to study for my master's. I'm going to graduate as well soon enough. Um, so, you know, I hope you don't get a big head over this and think you're some hotshot or someone special because you have a master degree. So many people have master degrees and they'll just go on and on and on about this. I know because this happened to me with my ex when I was studying for my PhD. Oh, he didn't let it go. And every time we had a fight over something, he would say, if you don't be careful, I'm going to stop you going to your own graduation. Alhamdulillah, I got divorced before I graduated. He wasn't there. It was the best day ever. But he used to threaten me with it so much because he absolutely hated the fact that I was doing a PhD and I was studying under scholars in Mecca University. He hated all of that. He wanted to belittle it as much as possible and he tried to sabotage my PhD on various occasions by stopping me travelling and hiding my laptop so I couldn't work on my thesis and oh, so many things. They do this to ruin your special day so that you don't graduate or you don't attend your graduation and if they attend, they cause a problem. If they attend, they attend with a moody face because they feel like you're more successful than them. They feel like you're now better than them. Now, you're not acting like you are, but in their minds, because everything is competition to them, they see it that way. I have a friend. She went to Canada with her husband to study medicine and she was actually better than him in her studies and her exams and she excelled quickly. And he got so jealous and he would always cause problems. He started telling her he wanted children. He started telling her he wanted her at home. He suddenly turned into a sheikh and he gave her all these Islamic reasons for her to be at home so that she no longer studies. And he forced her to quit. He forced her to quit because he was so incredibly jealous of her success. She made him feel like a failure because she was smarter than him, even though she never made him feel inadequate. But he couldn't handle the fact that they were both studying medicine and she was doing better. And her professors even offered her a job in the university she was studying in. And he couldn't handle it. He couldn't handle it. And he made her quit. And it was hell for her. Absolute hell. And she ended up getting a divorce after 10 years. She stayed with him for 10 years after that. And they went back to Saudi and he became a very well-known doctor in Saudi and she stayed at home and she said my heart used to burn every day because I knew my potential. I knew I had the potential to be an amazing doctor and she got a divorce after 10 years of being with him and she went back to Canada to resume her studies in medicine and she got offered a job in Canada which is a higher position and better pay. And she's now a surgeon in Canada and she's doing operations on high profile people. So, you know, these people, they will try to ruin your life and sabotage all your opportunities and all your special days. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills for you to be successful and wills for you to have your moment, no narcissistic demon can take that away from you. Okay, no one can take that away from you. What's written for you will come for you. 
So they love doing this in special occasions when they feel threatened by your success, when they feel threatened, you know, in their ego. Like my ego feels like it's being smashed. My ego feels like it's in pain because you now have something better than me. You now have an upper hand. You now make me feel inadequate. So I have to tear you down. I have to punish you for this. I have to punish you for the way you now make me feel, even though it's not your fault, it's my problem, but I'm going to punish you for it anyway. And notice as well, with a lot of narcissists, this could be your dad, your mum, your brother, you know, you'll give them some good news, like you've received a promotion and you want to go out for dinner, they'll reply with, well done, dot, or they'll just send you a thumbs up. Or they'll send you a good job. Dot. They won't ask you. They won't congratulate you. There's no mabrook. Nothing. Just that thumbs up. (laughs) They'll do things like this. Because they can't contain their jealousy. They can't contain their disappointment. That you have managed to achieve something that they didn't think you could. Or they didn't want you to achieve. So... If they're not telling you that they can do it as well, oh, it's easy. Anyone can get, you know, a PhD. Anyone can get, you know, qualifications in medicine. Anyone can get a promotion. If they're not telling you those things, they will just reply with very short messages or an emoji that communicates to you that they're not bothered and they're also jealous. It could be the launch of your business. You know, I'm going to... um, launch my business on Friday. I'd love it if you came. I'll see. I'm busy. I don't think I can make it, but good luck. You know, they'll send you very short messages like this, but the the most common one, the notorious one, is the thumbs up, that emoji, thumbs up. They'll send that to you like, yeah, all right. I will try my best to contain my jealousy, but I hope you don't see it in this thumbs up. (laughs) And, you know, another thing they do is they will make fun of you or make a joke out of it to, again, belittle your special day. So they might say something like, oh, finally you've graduated. God knows how long it took you. What, you're in your 40s now. You've just graduated from your bachelor degree. You took your time. You know, they might, they'll joke about something like that. Or you finally got that promotion. What did you have to do? Beg for it? Yeah, I bet you begged for it. Or you got your PhD or your master degree and they're like, oh, so who did you pay to do it then? You know, who who did you pay to write your thesis? And they'll send like, you know, all those laughing emojis and because they think they're so hilarious. They will send things like that. And even if you tell them you've met someone or you're getting engaged or you've got married, thumbs up, <laughs> thumbs up. They don't care. They might say something stupid like, oh, it's a miracle someone actually wanted to marry you. Who's this person? Who's this crazy person who wants to marry you? I hope you're not expecting me to meet this guy because I can't be bothered. So yeah, don't drag me into your problems because I already know this marriage isn't going to last very long. They say things like this. And you'll be looking forward to your engagement party or your walima or whatever. And then you receive a text like that from your dad or your brother, or your sister, or your mum. And it just leaves you in this mood, this low mood of feeling so unsupported and so unloved by your own family because they're so narcissistic and so envious of you. And I know a lot of people don't want to believe that their family members could be like this, but people have to wake up to reality sooner than later before... You know, they get destroyed by the people whom they call family. So moving on now to the religious reasons why narcissists do this to people. Okay, there's a spiritual reasoning behind this. And again, it's to do with the qareen. Okay, it's all to do with this evil jinn devil who is taking orders from Iblis because he or she is a soldier of Iblis at the end of the day. And... They will do whatever 
makes a bliss happy. And what makes a bliss happy is turning people against the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so whatever Allah has told us to do, Iblis wants us to go against it. And that's why narcissists will sabotage religious events in particular. So Eid is meant to be a joyous occasion. It's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for us. They ruin it because they are under the control of their qareen. Okay, they take orders from the waswas of their qareen. They are essentially worshipping their qareen. And worshipping Iblis indirectly. They don't know this, but they are. Because when they create a living hell out of Eid day, they are actually doing what Iblis wants them to do, rather than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants them to do. Okay, so Allah has told us to celebrate Eid, to, you know, make it a wonderful day of joy and fun and, and family and gatherings and everything. Because he wants us to celebrate what we've managed to achieve in Hajj and what we've managed to achieve in Ramadan. Okay, so it's a celebration for the believers. For the believers, listen to this, it's for the believers. So if you're not a believer, you're going to sabotage it. And narcissists are not believers. And Iblis detests no people more than the empathic believers so Iblis will send out orders to all his soldiers to sabotage whatever makes the empathic believers happy and whatever makes the empathic believers pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is to be peaceful, you know, during Ramadan, during Eid, during Arafat day, during the nights of, you know, Laylat al-Qadr. We're supposed to be peaceful and happy and spiritual and you know, striving to have a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when Iblis orders his soldiers to sabotage that for us, so we become depressed, distressed, anxious, we raise our voices, we go into rages and tantrums and we engage in reactive abuse during these holy days, these precious days, Iblis has won, right? Iblis has managed to get the empath in a state of low vibration, which is what narcissists operate at, to ruin these days that are full of so many blessings for empaths, okay, full of so much barakah for believers. There's so much ajr, right, so much reward, so much charity, so many good deeds, so many things that we can do to, you know, invest in our akhirah with and... Iblis and his soldiers want us to sabotage that for ourselves. And he does that through narcissists. So he will send us narcissists in our lives. Remember, Allah never sends the narcissist to us. He allows the narcissist to be a lesson. But the narcissist is never sent into our lives by Allah. They are always sent by Iblis. And it's us who allow them into our lives. Okay, we see the red flags and we make a decision. Do we allow this person in or do we not? So it's got nothing to do with Allah when it comes to narcissists coming into our lives. Allah allows us to learn a lesson when the narcissist comes into our lives, okay? So Iblis will send the narcissist into the lives of empaths to ruin all the good that we can do in these holy days. Because Iblis doesn't want to see us win. And when we win, we burn them. And that's shayateen al-ins wal jinn. Okay, so the human devils and the jinn devils. So the human narcissists whom we see and live with, they don't want to see us elevate our nafs. They don't want us to see the rewards of Allah's power to for our good deeds and our charity and our peace and everything good that we do. They don't want us to see any of that or reap any of that. So they put us in situations where we ruin every opportunity of blessing that can enter our lives by focusing on those holy days. Okay, notice even on Arafat day, even on the nights of Laylatul Qadr, they will cause problems. And the reason for that, the reason for those days where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised that he will forgive all our sins, it's those days they try to make us miss out on. 
So they give us extra things to do, they burden us with problems, they burden us with their rages and their tantrums because they don't want us to make the most of those days so that we're forgiven. They don't want us to reap all of those rewards of being forgiven in the dunya and akhirah because they actually envy the empaths for the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for them. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayah 109, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَدَّ كَثِيرٌ مِّنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ لَوْ يَرُدُّونَكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ إِيمَانِكُمْ كُفَّارًا حَسَدًا مِّنْ عِنْدِ أَنفُسِهِمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الْحَقِّ Allah says, Many people from among the people of the book wish that they could turn new believers back to disbelief because of their envy for your iman after the truth has been made clear to them. Okay, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us here that there will be people who claim to be from Ahl al-Kitab, who claim to be believers, but they're not believers because they do their best to make the believers kuffar. And they do this by, you know, behaving in a way that causes the depletion of iman in the believers because they envy you for your belief. They envy you for your good deeds that could lead you to forgiveness. And this is why they target the holy days. This is why they have to ruin all the Islamic occasions that are filled with rewards. Like Ramadan, Hajj, the Eid days, Arafat day, Laylat al-Qadr and so on. Okay, Those are the days they target in particular because they don't want you to reap the rewards. So this verse applies to Muslim narcissists too, okay? Allah is just giving us an example of the types of people and what they do to cause believers to turn into disbelievers. How many people do we know or have we seen who have left Islam as a result of narcissistic abuse at the hands of Muslims? This is the ayah that is applicable to them. Okay, this is what Allah is telling us. It's because they have hasad, they have envy for your iman, they have envy for you being in a higher position of nafs than they are. They know they're weak. They know that they're not strong. They know that you're more powerful than them because you have iman and you have a connection with Allah. They don't have it and they don't know how to have it because they're controlled by Iblis and his soldiers. Okay, so... When they see people have iman, and that iman gives them so much strength, they have to strip it away from you. They have to take it from you because they're envious of it. They're envious that you can be more powerful. Okay, the people who are narcissistic and psychopathic, they are the weakest of people. I'm going to do a whole podcast about the weakness of these people. Because a lot of people have the impression that they are the most powerful people when they're not. It's only because people are unaware of the spiritual side of this disorder that they believe the intimidation and the power and the false self of these narcissists because they claim to be and show themselves to be powerful people who are in control. So they've managed to brainwash a lot of people into believing that they truly are the most powerful people. We know they're not, okay? We know they're not and... I will explain it, inshallah, in detail with Quran and Hadith in another podcast, inshallah. But I wanted to mention this one because this is the reason why they target holy days. And Iblis works particularly hard on the empaths who have narcissists in their lives. Okay, so he will use the narcissists in their lives to just make joyous occasions a living hell. Until the empath gives up and they don't even want to be Muslim anymore. They don't even want to be doctors anymore. They don't want to pursue their dreams anymore. Khalas, they just want to stay at home. Basic nine to five job. Doing something they don't want to do. And they just plod on in life. Khalas, Iblis is happy. Mission accomplished. Right? That's why narcissists have plenty of sources of supply. Because... Iblis is like, next, next mission, next mission. 
You gotta jump on to the next person now. Khalas, mission completed with this one. Yalla, next supply. And that's why they always have to jump from supply to supply. They monkey branch to different people because there's no rest for the wicked, right? They're always on the go. They've always got a new mission set by their Qareen because their Qareen has taken orders from Iblis and their Qareen has to report back to Iblis. What did you make this person do today? I made this person do X, Y, Z. Well done. Well done. And your Qareen gets rewarded by Iblis in ways you can't see, but they do. And when the Qareen gets rewarded by Iblis, the ego of the narcissist gets rewarded and they feel powerful and they feel... You know, they feel like they've achieved something. I'll go into detail into all of this, inshallah, later. I have already in some podcasts, but there are some things that I haven't covered yet. But I'm getting there. Okay, just bear with me, I'm getting there. I'm working my way through it. (laughs) There's so much to cover. So they want you to miss out, okay? They want you to miss out on all the blessings and the rewards and... You know, especially knowing that Laylatul Qadr is a once a year thing. And Ramadan is a once in a year thing. And the, there's only two Eids in the year. So they will just try to ruin them for you. Because the guilt that you feel when you come out of Ramadan, knowing that the narcissist ruined it for you, and that you allowed it to happen, and that you did not allow it to become the Ramadan you wanted it to become, because you were so preoccupied with this narcissist who was adamant on making it so difficult for you, the guilt that you feel when you come out of Ramadan is something else. You feel awful, and now you're waiting for next Ramadan. You want Ramadan to come quickly so that you can make up for it. How many people feel like this? Too many people. Because the narcissist always ruins their Ramadan, always ruins their Eid. And so now you're looking forward to the next one to make up for it. Because this is what they do. This is what they do to you and your mental state. Okay? So it does backfire on them because they never look forward to Ramadan. But the empath always does. The believer always does because the believer is always asking themselves, you know, what can I do to redeem myself? What can I do to better myself? How can I improve next Ramadan? So if you feel this way, if you've come out of Ramadan feeling guilty that you haven't done enough, or you didn't, you know, do what you wanted to do, or you intended to do, this is a good sign, okay, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mercy for you, he's got love for you, because not a lot of people think that way, not a lot of people feel that way, a lot of people don't feel bad for not making the most of Ramadan, they don't care, they're just so happy it's over, and they can eat again, but the true believer will always feel like they didn't do enough, and that they're looking forward to the next one to make it a better one. This is a good sign. And it's a clear sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you, okay? So don't feel bad about your Ramadan not being productive. Alhamdulillah, the intention is there. And Allah will reward you in accordance to your intention. Because Allah sees that narcissists do make life very difficult for people who are trying their best in Ramadan, trying their best in Eid, Arafat day, and all the other you know, important days like Hashura and, you know, when you go for Hajj or Umrah, Allah knows you're trying your best and the narcissist is making it a living nightmare. A living nightmare. Don't think Allah doesn't see that. Allah sees it all. So don't be in despair over a Ramadan that was lost. A Ramadan is never lost when the intention is good from the beginning. Okay, if your intention was to perfect your Ramadan, you'll get the reward for that, inshallah, even if you didn't manage to. And if you intended to fast on Arafat day, or wake up for Qiyam, you know, or Laylatul Qadr, but you weren't able to because of this narcissist in your life, you know, stressing you out, didn't wake you up for Fajr, didn't wake you up for Qiyam, you know, switched your alarm off, yes, some of them do that as well, they'll switch your alarm off, so you miss Qiyam, don't worry. All the rewards... And the benefits that come with Laylatul Qadr and Arafat Day and Ashura Day and all of those holy days, you will reap them. Okay, you will reap all of them with your intention to fulfill those acts of worship. Okay, you will get them inshallah. Anyone who dies with the intention of going to Hajj, but they didn't go for Hajj, 
you will get the reward of going for Hajj. Because it was your intention and your plan to go next year. But subhanAllah, you died before you managed to go. But it was your intention. Khalas, you were saving up for it. And you were planning to go in 2025. You didn't make it to 2025. You will get the reward of going to Hajj. So don't let your qareen and their waswas manipulate you and fool you and trick you, deceive you into believing that none of it counted because your Ramadan wasn't productive. You didn't wake up for qiyam. You didn't do this and you didn't do that. Okay, that's all waswas. Allah has counted all of it, inshallah, for you because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the empathic believers more than any other people. Okay, so the intentions of those who are empathic and believers, they will always be so special to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah will never let those people down. Allah will always look after those people and forgive those people and show mercy to those people. Okay, despite all the narcissism in your life, Allah has mercy for you and he has love for you. That's how he's getting you through all of these horrible experiences Okay, you, you're coming out better on the other side, inshallah. So don't let people who commit major sins tell you that you are a person of bid'ah. Okay, so for example, I know there are lots of Sufis, for example, who like to celebrate the Prophet's birthday, salam. You know, they celebrate the Mawlid. Again, I'm not saying this is haram or halal. It's something that some people do. And you get some narcissists who say, you know, you are people of innovation, this is a bid'ah, this is haram, but they commit every major sin under the moon and the sun. Again, this is manipulation, because what's better, to celebrate the birthday of the Prophet, or to commit major sins? Which one will be more haram than the other? It's just logic. People have got to use their brains, because it always seems to be the people who physically abuse their family members and they are vile in their da'wah, they are vile in their character, who attack those who celebrate birthdays and the mawlid. And that's why people can't take them seriously, right? They can't take them seriously because they're not even looking at their own character, they're not looking at their own state of iman, which is rock bottom along with their nafs. Okay, so a lot of people use these reasons to justify ruining a special occasion for someone so maybe celebrating you know the mola is something very important to someone and they ruin the special occasion by you know calling them people of bid'ah and they're doing haram and they're going to hell and so on and so on and so they come out with all this spiritual abuse towards these people who you know in their eyes they're doing something innocent but they're being attacked by narcissistic people whom, you know, these are the true problematic people who are committing so much haram and it's almost like they're delusional to it. And I had a few people say to me before I recorded my last podcast about the narcissists who support the Palestinian cause, um, loads of people said to me, you know, when they complain to their husbands and wives about the abuse that's being inflicted upon them in Ramadan, they would always say things like, you know, you have no idea what abuse is. I think I need to send you to Gaza for you to understand what real abuse is so that you can come back and be grateful to me, you know, that I'm not Netanyahu. I'm not inflicting all this uh, abuse on you and I'm not murdering you and I'm not starving you and I'm not doing this and I'm not doing that. They compare themselves to tyrants and the scum of the earth because that's all they have to measure up against. Okay, they can only think of the worst monsters, the worst demons you can you can imagine. They compare themselves to those types of people, those types of creatures. They can never compare themselves to prophets and people of character and scholars and you know, amazing people, they can never do that. They have to compare themselves to their own kind who are at a very advanced level, right? You think I'm an abuser? Oh, go and see what Netanyahu is doing to his people and then 
come back and tell me if I'm an abuser. See, an empath would never say that, but a narcissist will because they know that they're all from the same swamp. It's just some narcissists are more advanced than others. Some have reached psychopathic level. Some have reached a level even worse than Iblis. Because at least Iblis is a believer, right? Iblis knows that there's a God. He knows, he believes that there's a heaven and a hell. But there are people like Netanyahu in the world who are so arrogant, it surpasses the arrogance of Iblis. It surpasses it. But narcissists compare themselves to these people because they know they belong in the same ugly, dirty, smelly swamp as them, right? They're all destined for the same fate. And so I'm going to compare myself to the master. That's my master. I'm just a trainee, but I'm getting there. I am working my way up the ladder to become a psychopath. And that's what they do. So many narcissists started off as man children and women children, and they became full-blown psychopaths. You think Netanyahu became like that in one day and one night. It was gradual. It was gradual from his childhood. He didn't start off like that. He started off as an innocent child. And that's where life took him, because he's a satanic worshipper, like every other narcissist, but some are more aware of it than others. So that's basically everything in a nutshell you know, to explain to you why they ruin special occasions and especially the religious ones. And I want you to take note of something as well. When it comes to their special occasions, they want you to go all out for them. If you ever miss their special occasion or their birthday or you ruin Eid for them or you ruin their birthday or you ruin their graduation, oh, oh, God help you. God help you. They'll never forget it. And they'll punish you for it. Because how dare you forget the important days of your master? How dare you? You are the peasants. You are the one who serves me. I, I can afford to dismiss and ignore and not turn up and not acknowledge anything that you do. But me, I'm your master. Oh, God help you. God help you if you ever forget or if you ever dismiss or ignore anything that I do and you don't glorify me and celebrate me and put me on a pedestal and tell me how amazing I am and block my ego and show off to the whole world about me, God help you if you don't do that. And you'll notice they get into a massive sulk and they'll punish you for ages with the silent treatment. If you do not get them what they want on their birthday, if you do not give them the read they want, if you do not do the things that they expected you to do, yeah, it's a different story when it comes to them. Everything that you expect from them, they don't want to do for you, but they want you to do all of it for them. Because they have such fragile egos, it's important and critical for them that they always feel important, they always feel special. Okay, so they don't care how many birthdays they missed of yours and how many Eids they ruined. They don't care about all of that. When it comes to their special days, you have to remember, even if they've done nothing for you, they will sulk about it. Now, I've spoken to a number of people who have told me that despite the narcissist ruining their special occasions and not buying them gifts and not doing anything special for them, on those days, they will go out of their way to continue doing nice things for the narcissist on their special days. And I ask them, why? Why do you do that? Why do you let them get away with not doing it for you, but you do everything for them? You make their birthday special and anniversary special and everything else special. You know, you celebrate their promotions, you celebrate their business launches, but they never do that for you. Why do you do it? And they say, oh, we don't want to be mean and we're doing this for the sake of Allah. You know, we're empaths and, you know, we have to show Allah that we are better and, you know, I don't want this person making my heart go black. You know, I'm going to continue doing all the nice things for them and showing them that I'm a good person, right? I'm an empathic person, that I'm not a narcissist. 
and I don't want to be punished for being mean. This person is my wife. This person is my husband. I fear getting punished by Allah if I do not show love and compassion towards this person. Even if they don't show it to me, it's fine. But I don't want to be the person who doesn't give and doesn't do nice things for my parent, my sibling, my husband, wife, whoever. And I just say to them, okay, what did you get out of that? How has that served you? How is that working out for you? Did the abuse stop? No. Did it get worse? Yes. Did they ever do anything for you after that? No. Okay. So you're enabling the behaviour. You are teaching the narcissist that it's okay to continue treating you in this way on every special and religious occasion because despite what they do, you're still going to give them everything they want. Why should they stop? You're serving them and it's in their favour that they continue being tyrannical with you. Tell me, why would they stop? They're getting away with everything but they're getting everything that they need and want from you. It's a perfect life. That's a perfect situation for a narcissist. You're not helping the narcissist by allowing them to get away with it. And you're not helping them by enabling this behavior for the sake of Allah. Okay? There is no for the sake of Allah in this kind of situation. You are enabling the behavior of someone who is not going to change because you have not put boundaries of respect up. And if you have not put boundaries of respect up, you are always going to get walked all over and the abuse will get worse because they have no respect for you. They see you as someone who is willing to trample on all of their rights and everything that they want and desire for the sake of keeping them in your life. You want to keep this demon in your life. That's how they see it. I'm so demonic. I am an awful husband, an awful parent, an awful wife. I don't do anything for this person. But they still treat me like a king, like a queen. They glorify me. They put me on a pedestal. It means I'm doing the right thing. I'm going to continue with the abuse. Tell me what would make them stop. You think they're going to have shame and stop? You think they're going to feel bad and stop and wake up one day and think, oh, you know, I'm being, I'm being a bit of a douchebag here. I think I need to um, make some effort and, you know... And do the right thing by this person. This person has a demonic spirit. This person has a disorder. The more you enable this behaviour and let them get away with it, the worse your life is going to be because the less respect they're going to have for you. They're now thinking, he or she can't get better than me. They're staying with me and putting up with all this hell that I put them through and all this deprivation because they have no self-worth no self-value. I know it sounds difficult to hear. I know it might come across as harsh. I'm saying this to you out of love because I want you to open your eyes to what's going on. Staying with a narcissist 5, 10, 15, 20 years and enabling this behaviour puts you in the wrong as well. Okay? People need to take accountability for the enabling that they are allowing to happen. Okay, this enabling behaviour is what's keeping you stuck in a trauma bond and stuck in an abusive cycle. The only time, the only time a narcissist will do what you want them to do is when you walk away from the relationship. It could be any relationship, friendship, parental, marriage, whatever. When you walk away, you've had enough of being treated this way and they try to hoover you back in with what you originally wanted. It's the only time they will give you what you want. Okay? Let's say you were with them for five years and in five years they never celebrated your birthday and celebrating your birthday is important to you. And they never got you a cake. They never got you the iPhone you wanted. They never bought you flowers, got you chocolates, took you on holiday. They never took you on a nice day out, a romantic meal, a lovely date. They didn't do any of that. Every birthday they had their excuses for not doing any of those things. You walk away and they want to hoover you back in. They realise actually, you know, this person has enabled me 
to get away with so much. I can't lose this supply. This is great. This is great supply for me. I need them back. How do I get them back? They start low effort in the beginning. You know, they might cry and please, I can't live without you and all that rubbish, right? You don't come back. So they resort to plan B. And they start giving you what you'd originally asked for that they didn't do. That's how they hoover you back into a trauma bond. Guys, I'm telling you, they'll get you five birthday cakes <laughs> to make up for the last five years. They will sing you happy birthday in five different languages if they have to. And they will get you five different iPhones, five different colours. Which one do you want? Just take them all. I don't care. Just come back. And there will be no more cheap petrol station flowers. You'll get a nice bouquet of flowers this time and you'll get a nice box of chocolates. Yeah? Which proves to you that they could always do it. But they chose not to. They didn't want to. They can always get you what you want. But they decide to play dumb and they don't get it for you. Because they save it for the hoover. They save it for a time when they know they're going to need it as bait to get you back in. And now you fall for it and you think, oh, okay. Well, he's made it up to me. She's made it up to me. That's fine. They must have changed. They must have worked on themselves. They must now see the error of their ways. Okay, I'll go back. And you get hoovered back in. And they're laughing at you. Wallahi, they're laughing at you. They're like, oh, that was easy. That was so easy. And then that's why the second round of abuse is worse. Because they've got no respect. For them, it was so easy for them to hoover you back in. A narcissist will only respect you when you can no longer be hoovered back in. Okay, when you put your foot firmly in the ground and you say to them, I don't want your five birthday cakes. I don't want your five iPhones. I don't want your five star trip to Bali that you now want to take me on that I've been begging you for for the last five years. You had your chance. I gave you a chance to do that for me when I was with you. And now that I'm not with you, you want to do them for me? Sorry, tough luck. Slam that door in their face. You do not go back. Okay, you do not go back for another round of abuse because they have lost more respect for you. You don't do it. Because wallahi, that's what you're going to get. I'm saying wallahi because it's guaranteed. It's guaranteed because it's a part of their disorder. Every time they hoover you back in, they lose more respect for you. Because for them, you're easy to get. For them, they believe that, wow, she believes she can't get better than me. After all that abuse, she still thinks... I'm the best person to come back to. She's got no other options. Or he's got no other options. I can... You know, it becomes a game to hoover you back in every time. It just proves to them that they are king. That they are queen. With all their rubbish behaviour. And their disorder. And their satanic energy. They're still king. And they're still queen. And this empath is still coming back to me. Obviously, you're going to be codependent if you're going back. right? An empath won't go back. Codependent will go back. That's why you need to work on your codependency. Because this is damn serious. Okay? It's damn serious. You don't understand what you're signing up for every time you allow yourself to get hoovered back in. If they lose you, let them lose you. Don't ever go back to someone who shows you, proves to you, That they could have done all those things all along, but they just chose not to. Well, how would you go back to someone like that? Why? For them to ruin more Eids, and more Ramadans, and more birthdays, and more graduations, and more happy events? You're going back for that? That's what you're signing up for when you go back after a hoover. When you walk away from a narcissist, you have to walk away for good. You can't go back. Because Iblis has sent his Qareen on a mission to get you back. And when he gets you back, next time, they're going to try even harder to destroy you. Ask anybody, anybody who has been hoovered back into a narcissistic relationship and ask them, did your life get better or did it get worse? It gets worse. Because next time they might be stuck with a child. Next time they might be stuck in a different country with that person. Next time they would have lost their iman. Next time they would have lost their health to an autoimmune disease. Next time they would have lost their mental health. Even more of it. 
Ask anybody who's been hoovered back in. I promise you that's what they'll tell you. Because that's their mission. That's their satanic mission. Don't sign up for more ruined Eids and ruined Ramadans. Because if you do, Allah will ask you about that. Allah will ask you about that. Why did you go back to someone who was clearly not good for your Iman, clearly not good for your life? Because at the end of the day, we have to acknowledge that Allah gave us a brain to think with. Okay, we can't say, oh, I went back because of the children. I went back because of this and I went back because of that and what people are going to say. No, Allah's going to question your intellect that he gave you. This person has abused you for the last five years and shown you that they are horrid. Why go back? Why go back to this person? And if they're going to change, their change has to be consistent and they need to go to therapy and psychotherapy and they need to go for ruqya and all sorts of things have to happen before you can even consider taking back someone like this. I'm not saying they can't change. There are narcissists who do change and there are some people who are exceptions to the rule who go back to a narcissist and alhamdulillah the narcissist did get better. Very rare. Very rare. I would say 3% of people are in that situation. All you have to do is ask the people around you and you'll know how rare it is for a narcissist to change. Okay? If you need help with codependency, reach out to me. I give counselling and coaching for this to get you out of it. My email is below. So I'll end it with some advice on how to deal with narcissists in the Eid that's coming up. I'm releasing this now so you're prepared for the Eid that's coming, inshallah, next week. I want you to have no expectations of narcissistic people. Don't have any expectations of them being happy, celebrating, being joyous, giving you gifts, taking on a, a nice date, on a nice family day out, on a holiday. Don't have any expectations. Stop having any high expectations from these people. Okay, this is what they're like. If you've already experienced a few Ramadans and a few Eids like this already with them, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, get rid of the expectations and don't allow yourself to be depressed by their behaviour and their lack of effort. It's a part of their disorder. The second thing is don't take it personally when they do it. It's got nothing to do with your self-worth. It's got nothing to do with your ability to be a good wife or a husband or a parent or a sibling or a friend. It's got nothing to do with that. This is their disorder. They can't help it. They are under the control of their qareen. Okay, they have a choice. They can help it, they have a choice, but they can't help but behave in this way because this is the package of the disorder. Because they feel so unworthy and they hate themselves, they have to project that hate onto others and it causes a lot of people to take it personally and then you end up becoming narcissistic because you start hating yourself as well. You now start feeling that you're not worthy and you're unloved and that you're not deserving of anything good. And now slowly, slowly, your codependent self starts to slip into a narcissistic self and you become like them, okay? Because you've taken it personally, that's how people slip into that level of nafs because you allow the narcissist to influence you so much to the degree where they shape your entire perception of yourself based on what they project onto you, okay? Third thing, don't let them ruin your day. You carry on with your plans, you do fun things with your kids. Don't allow them to depress you. Don't allow them to ruin the beauty of the the holy month and those holy days Okay, of Eid. Enjoy them. Enjoy them as much as you possibly can. If they want to stay at home and sulk, let them stay at home and sulk. Leave them behind. Just do your best to grey rock as much as you can and make the most of what you can with a narcissist being around. And just try to minimise conflicts and fights and arguments as much as possible. And if you have children, try and make it as wonderful as you can for them. Okay, make it as fun as you can. Like I said, even if he doesn't or she doesn't participate in Eid with you, 
it doesn't matter. Trust me, you are so much better off without the narcissist during Eid. Leave them to it. Leave them to do whatever they want to do. If they want to disappear and go off with their friends, let them do it. If they want to go and see their family for the whole day, let them do it. It doesn't matter. Grey rock, okay? As long as you are not depressed and your children are not depressed, alhamdulillah. Okay, that's an achievement, being around a narcissist. Okay, so try and make the most of it. And the fourth thing is, of course, dua. Make lots of dua for your protection from their qareen. Make dua for protection from their evil character. Okay, the darkness of their character and their bad intentions towards you. Always make dua that Allah protects you and your children from that. Always make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the strength to deal with it and gives you the patience to be able to get through, you know, these special days so that they don't ruin them. Okay, you need that patience, you need that strength so that you do not engage in reactive abuse and you do not ruin it for yourself so that you feel guilty after. Okay, make loads of dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it easy for you so that you can manage the situation until, until Allah gets you out of it one day. Okay, and Allah will only get you out of it when you take the necessary steps to free yourself from a demon. You've got to. You've got to. I never encourage anyone to stay with a demon. I could never. Because I know how damaging it is. So until the day you find that bravery and, you know, you, you, you find yourself in a situation where you can free yourself, just continue making dua that Allah protects you from their evil and that... Allah guides them, inshallah, okay? At the end of the day, you need to pray for them too. Pray that Allah guides them, especially if they are the father of your children, the mother of your children. If you feel stuck, if you feel like you can't leave and that you need to stay, then the best you can do is pray for them, right? Pray that Allah opens their eyes one day to their narcissism and that they do something about it. But again, you're not there to fix them. You're not there to change them. You know, if you find over time that nothing is changing, your life is getting worse, your health is deteriorating, your iman is deteriorating, you actually need to take steps to get out of that situation. Because if you stay, it's your choice to stay and you are now contributing towards the depletion of you know, your health in many aspects. Okay, You are now participating in that decision. So take active steps to free yourself get your independence if you need to get a job if you need to for financial security do whatever you need to do to get yourself out of the clutches of a demon even if they are your parents i can't emphasize on this enough i've got loads more podcasts coming about this inshallah but i wanted to release this now um so that you're prepared for eid inshallah so i hope it's helped inshallah i hope it's given you some clarity i hope you know, it's helped someone out there. And if you're single, I really hope that, you know, you understand the seriousness of, you know, marrying people like this who display any signs of narcissism. It's not worth it. It's not worth the risk, okay? And thank you for listening if you're still with me until now. It's 3.30 in the morning and I need to go and pray. So I'll end it here, inshallah. And I pray that you benefit from it. Again, my details are below. If you need to reach out, do order my book. If you haven't already, do read it. It will really help you, inshallah, understand so much about yourself and the people around you. And as always, I'd like to kindly ask you to like the podcast. If it's helped you, please share it with people whom you feel could benefit from it. And do subscribe to the channel if you'd like more content that is related to this subject. Okay, I've got loads more coming. So I hope you all have a wonderful Eid, inshallah, stress-free, narc-free as much as possible. And until the next podcast, inshallah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.